A few months ago, I was doing research for a video about central bank digital currencies, or CBDCs. I was curious about which country was the first to begin exploring a CBDC, and to my surprise, it was Uruguay. What's even more surprising is that the company that was commissioned by Uruguay to develop its CBDC is based in Switzerland, and there is almost no public information about this company. As it turns out, this Swiss company is responsible for printing most of the physical currency in existence, and today I'm going to tell you how it found its way into almost every central bank around the world. Now, I'll start by saying that pretty much all the information in this video comes from a book called Moneymakers, The Secret World of Banknote Printing, written by Klaus Bender. Klaus has been a journalist and author since the 1970s and spent most of his career traveling the world reporting on finance and economics. In the late 90s, Klaus started doing the research for Moneymakers. During his research, he made multiple discoveries, which he published as articles in various German newspapers. One of these was about the misprint of 300 million 100 euro banknotes in the year 2000, which cost the ECB 15 million euros to fix. Moneymakers was published in 2004 and quickly became a bestseller in Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. An English language version of the book was published in 2006, and it includes an additional section which argues that the highest quality counterfeit US dollar bills are being printed by the CIA in the United States. It should come as no surprise then that the back of the book reads, quote, the book is based exclusively on personal interviews and confidential information normally not accessible to outsiders. There were attempts to stop this research project. I'll leave a link to the book in the description, but I'll reiterate that it was published way back in 2004. This means that not all the information in the book may be up to date. That said, the sections I'll be summarizing today have mostly to do with historical events, so everything should still hold true. To my knowledge, no other book about banknote printing has been published since Moneymakers, and it's only the second book to be published about the subject at all. The first was published in the early 1980s, and it was actively suppressed by the companies I'll be discussing today. More about that later. And, in case you're wondering, yes, that statistic about cocaine being on almost all the physical cash in existence is true. A study by the Bristol Institute in 1999 found that 99% of all British banknotes in circulation had traces of cocaine on them. Also, did you know that cash was the name of the currency issued during the Chinese Ming Dynasty in the 1300s? And did you know that the first paper banknotes were issued during the Chinese Tang Dynasty way back in the 7th century? Well, now you do. So, armed with that vital information, let's dig in. Now, believe it or not, but most of the physical currency in circulation was not created by central banks. It was created by companies which own the machines and the ink used to make banknotes. Most of the central banks which do create their own physical currencies still use the machines and inks of these companies. The shiny ribbons on cash and the watermarks you see on higher value bills when you hold them up to the light are all inventions of these companies too. What's crazy is that these companies have sold their inventions to just about every country in the world, including sanction states like North Korea. The nature of these companies and their operations have been a closely guarded secret for centuries. This is because citizens would be up in arms if they knew how their currencies were being created and would probably revolt if they knew the details of these banknote printing contracts. As with empires, though, it seems that every single enterprise associated with banknote printing has experienced a rise and a fall. This is due to a combination of corruption and competition. The former led to incompetence, and the latter led to leaks to the press about the inner workings of the industry. As quoted by Klaus, quote, Attempts to engage representatives of the industry in conversation while doing research for this book were systematically deflected. However, as long as it was about their competitor, 
many interview partners then turned out to be downright forthcoming. Obviously, sharing this kind of insider information is a risky business. The author of the first book about banknote printing in the 1980s found this out when the money printers bought up every single copy in circulation. This made it impossible to find the book, and any remaining copies were extremely expensive as a result. As for Klaus, he found himself face to face with the CEO of the company responsible for making the money printing machines that created almost all the physical currency in circulation. This was after he published an article explaining that 2% of the income for every printed banknote went to the CEO. In case you didn't catch that, the CEO of the company which created more than 90% of all the physical currency in circulation was given 2% of the income generated for creating this physical currency. These payments were made in gold because the CEO knew damn well that his own printed paper cash was worthless. So the CEO in question is an Italian man named Galtiero Giori, who headed the Giori company from its founding until his death. As is often the case with such businesses, the Giori company ultimately got off the ground because of Gualtiero's family history in the printing industry. Gualtiero's grandfather, Dino Cohen, set up a printing company in the late 1870s. The Officiene Grafice Cohen e Compagnia went on to print stocks, bonds and checks for Italian banks and brokers. In 1939, the company was chosen by the French government to begin printing banknotes for the country. The only problem is that 1939 is when the Second World War began, and any students of history will know that Italy and France were on opposite sides in that conflict. Almost everyone will also know that the Axis powers, which included Italy, were not so friendly towards a particular ethnic minority, to put it lightly. Rather than flee to Switzerland with the rest of his family, however, Gualtiero decided to take his mother's maiden name and stay in Italy. That's because he wanted to defend the printing plant and its machinery from destruction by the Germans and the bombs of the Allies. By some miracle, he succeeded. In 1947, Gualtiero continued where his family had abruptly left off before the war, printing physical currency for governments. He created his first money printing machine called the Piloto and sold it to multiple countries in Latin America, where his father Renato had fled to during World War II. Now, I suspect that it's the connections that Renato and his family made in Latin America which led to Uruguay tapping the Giori company in 2014 to develop its CBDC. I'll leave a link to our video about CBDCs versus cryptocurrencies in the description if you want to learn more about that. Anyways, what made the Giori company's money printing machines different from the others at the time was that they were capable of multicolor intaglio printing. Now, intaglio is a method of engraving metal, which was invented during the Renaissance. It was most often used to create ceremonial armor, fact fans. Although Gualtiero was revered in the currency community for having perfected the intaglio printing method, the United States and Europe were not all that interested in having colorful cash. Not only that, but the machines used for the printing required lots of maintenance and would regularly break down. This is why the manager of another printing company put Gualtiero in touch with a German company called Koenig & Bauer, which was famous for creating the printing machines for the Times newspaper. Note that the first Bitcoin block happens to reference a headline from the Times. This makes me wonder whether Satoshi Nakamoto read Moneymakers and chose the Times specifically for this reason. After all, the book was published in 2004, and Satoshi could have chosen any other newspaper to convey the message that central banks had messed up the financial system yet again. Just a thought. In any case, Gualtiero apparently got along really well with the CEO of Koenig & Bauer, despite their age difference. In 1952, they signed an agreement to work together. The Giori company would provide the specifications for cutting-edge money printing, and Koenig & Bauer would make the quality machines. The Giori company subsequently relocated to Switzerland for political and economic reasons. Being based in Switzerland allowed the company to do business with just about any individual or institution, and the company would be able to keep its unprecedented wealth lightly taxed and well hidden. 
The jewellery company chose the Swiss canton of Lausanne for its headquarters in large part because of another company called Sitzpa being based there. Sitzpa is short for Société Industrielle et Commerciale de Produits Amont, and it is the company that produces the ink for basically all the physical cash around the world. Naturally, Gualtiero was best friends with Albert Amont, the CEO of Sitzpa. Like the jewellery company, Sitzpa owes its success to its family history. In this case, it was Albert's father, Maurice Amont, who came to France as an immigrant from Lebanon and founded Sitzpa in 1927. Now, Sitzpa originally specialised in colouring agents for farm products. This includes making butter more yellow and green peas greener. Sitzpa got into the money printing business thanks to Gualtiero and has managed to maintain its monopoly on money ink thanks to its uncopyable chemical formula. The jewellery company's proximity to Sitzpa, as well as Koenig & Bauer in nearby Germany, made it possible for the company to do absolutely everything in-house, from start to finish. And a clause in the company's contract with Koenig & Bauer meant that Gualtiero would own all the patents in perpetuity. Lovely jubbly. Before long, the jewellery company's money printing machines were flying off the shelves. The first buyer was a currency printing company based in the Netherlands, which made Dutch money. The second buyer was the Central Bank of Austria. From there, the snowball continued to grow. Tensions inevitably began to rise between the jewellery company and the incumbents in the industry. At the time, the British company Delarue was the largest money printer around. It began using its influence to stifle the adoption of the jewellery company's money printers and went to some very low lows in order to do so. This is probably because Delarue was starting to worry that the jewellery company would poach Delarue's largest client, the United States of America. Despite having been adopted almost everywhere else, the jewellery company's money printing machines just couldn't get a spot in Uncle Sam's backyard. So, eventually, the jewellery company did what the age-old adage says, if you can't beat them, join them. And so, in 1965, the jewellery company signed a deal with Delarue. The only thing that kept the partnership from instantly falling apart was Gualtiero's friendship with the CEO of Delarue, Peter Orchard it's safe to say that this friendship wasn't all that close because while Delarue went around showcasing the jewellery company's machines to central banks, Gualtiero was secretly doing the same. Whereas Delarue wanted contracts, Gualtiero offered to sell the machines, no subscription required. Delarue didn't seem to notice because it managed to give the jewellery company what it always wanted, access to the American market. The jewellery company built custom money printing machines for the Federal Reserve and became the sole supplier of machines for the Fed in the years that followed. The United States became one of the biggest purchasers of the jewellery company's money printing machines alongside China, India and Russia. And as far as I know, physical US dollars in the United States continue to be printed using the jewellery company's machines to this day. Having bagged the big fish, the jewellery company turned its attention to the little fish it had left behind. These included the sanctioned state of Iran, which received a jewellery company money printer with the help of Thailand, and the sanctioned state of North Korea, which never paid for its money printers in full. While the North Korean government stopped paying on the grounds that the jewellery company was a, quote, capitalist exploiter, Klaus speculates the real reason was because it couldn't get access to or couldn't export the physical gold that the jewellery company and its CEO required as payment. But then again, it's North Korea, so... Now, by this point, the jewellery company seemed to be higher up in the world hierarchy than the World Economic Forum. To paraphrase an epic paragraph from the book, quote, In the end, it was mostly Gualtiero who determined what the customer would order or what he would have to order. The central banks were at his mercy. They were traversing uncharted terrain. They lacked the experience, but they wanted their own money printers, even if it warred with all economic reason. And then came Japan. 
Now, what's interesting is that Japan reportedly has an extremely high demand for cash compared to other countries, or at least it did when the book was written. This is because of Japan's culture of cleanliness. Physical bills with any kind of defects are immediately recalled, and new crisp bills are issued in their stead. This abnormally high demand for new cash meant that Japan was the ideal client for the jewelry company. At the same time, the Japanese government was seeing a surge in counterfeit bills. It therefore required higher quality bills that would be harder to copy. It was truly a match made in heaven. The thing is that the Japanese government didn't want to be reliant on a foreign Western company for its physical currency. As such, it gave one of the 36 machines it purchased to a Tokyo money printing company called Komori and instructed it to reverse engineer the jewelry company's crown jewel. Upon hearing that the Japanese government was looking to counterfeit the jewelry company's money printer, Gualtiero made what was, in retrospect, the worst decision of his life. Realizing he couldn't exercise influence over the Japanese government, Gualtiero gave them the blueprints to his machine. In exchange, he made the Japanese swear to not export their version of the jewelry company's money printers made by Komori. He also demanded that Komori become the exclusive supplier of money printing machines to the Bank of Japan, once again establishing a soft monopoly for jewelry. This agreement lasted for around 15 years before the Japanese decided they'd had enough of sitting on the sidelines while the Swiss got rich. When Gualtiero got word, he tried to throw the legal book at the Japanese government. Let's just say you need one hell of a throwing arm to hit Japan from Switzerland. And then, in 1989, Germany's Giseka and Devriant, the second largest money printing company whose manager had originally arranged the meeting between the CEOs of the jewelry company and Koenig and Bauer many decades before, ordered a sample money printing machine from Komori. Soon, rumors started to spread that the Russians had begun buying Komori machines. Meanwhile, China started buying money printing machines from Mitsubishi. The fact that this purchase happened despite China and Japan's heated history underscored the quality of the Japanese money printing machines. After that, it didn't take long for India to cave, especially since it was getting shafted by the jewelry company's high prices paid in gold. Gualtiero tried and failed to pressure the Japanese to withdraw their money printing machinery from these regions. It was clear, though, that his influence on fiat was fading fast. In 1992, Gualtiero Giori passed away, and his son Roberto Giori took the helm at the company. Roberto went on to effectively dismantle what his father had built by destroying all the relationships that had made the Giori company a monopoly in the money printing industry. Funnily enough, this seems to include the website for the Roberto Giori Company, which is the first result you get when you search Giori Company on Google. You can actually see what the website used to look like using the Wayback Machine archive, and I'll leave a link to that in the description if you're interested. Now, all the while, the Japanese continued to expand their money printing presence until it arrived at the borders of the Giori Company. Komori Managed to secure contracts in Germany, only to have them wrested out of its hands by the Giori Company through a lengthy and costly counteroffensive of sorts. Unfortunately for Komori, the economic crisis in Japan in the 1990s forced the company to scale back its operations. Unfortunately for the Giori Company, it was in as bad a bad a shape. In 2001, d e l a r u e sold its 50% stake in the Giori Company to Koenig and Bauer. For a mere 50 million Swiss francs. The other 50% was purchased by Roberto Giuri's own private investment firm for the same price tag. It doesn't take a genius to see that the Giuri company was worth a lot more. Accounting firm Ernst Young estimated it was worth at least 275 million Swiss francs, and the Saudis were ready to buy. News that Roberto had claimed half of his father's company for himself. Caused infighting within the immediate Giori family and its Cohen counterparts. This negatively affected the operations of the company, and all the settlements significantly drained its gold encrusted coffers. The Giori company's reign over the money printing industry was then ended by the technological innovation of the early 2000s. 
central banks started to move away from the physical and into the digital. This affected Koenig and Bauer the most. It had zero orders for new money printing machines in 2001. At the time that the book was published, the only demand left for the money printing machines created by the two companies came from replacing old or broken ones. Sitzpa still maintains its monopoly over the ink because its chemical formula can't be copied, unlike the hardware. And unfortunately for all the money printing companies, governments around the world are now rushing to roll out their central bank digital currencies. Ironically enough, it looks like there's a new generation of secret moneymakers on the rise, and you can learn about one of them using the link in the description. And that's all for today's video about the secret world of money printing. If you found it as fascinating as I did, be sure to smash that like button to let me know. If you want to make sure you don't miss the next flick, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell. If you can't wait for the next video to come out, head on over to Coin Bureau Clips to get more crypto content like this, and check out the Coin Bureau podcast if you're looking for longer form discussions. You can also follow me on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram for memes and hot takes in real time, and join my Telegram for daily crypto updates you can't do without. If you want to know what comes next for the crypto market, subscribe to my weekly newsletter to get my forward guidance, as well as an exclusive look at my crypto portfolio. It's free and there is no spam. If you want to support what we do, head on over to the Coin Bureau merch store and get yourself a crypto hoodie, sweater, tee, or mug that matches your crypto mood. You can find your way to all these resources and more using the links in the description. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you next time. Till then, adieu, adios, quaheri, gule gule, goodbye.